A duty hat! Hello and welcome to Cryptic Web Chronicles. Make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoy today's video. Today we'll be taking a look at the Opie and Anthony Iceberg chart to learn more about the radio show Opie and Anthony and the community of fans that followed it. Stay tuned as we're about to take a deep dive into the hilarious, insane, and at times dark and depraved incidents that surround this notorious shock jock radio show. Before we begin, for those who may not be familiar, Opie and Anthony are a radio duo that hosted a radio show of the same name from March of 1995 until July of 2014. Since its beginnings, Opie and Anthony was considered a shocking and controversial show, with its hosts Greg Opie Hughes and Anthony Cumia being known for their off-color and provocative sense of humor that always pushed the envelope and regularly shocked listeners. In 2001, comedian Jimmy Norton would join the show as a third mic, and the show would often have various other stand-up comedians and celebrities on as guests. As you'll soon see, however, the show was mired with controversies and scandals, and Opie and Anthony's antics would land them in hot water several times throughout their careers, with both of them being fired from the radio business on more than one occasion. All credit for this iceberg goes to Opie and Anthony Forum's user, Solo Joe Acoustic Show, who originally put all of this together back in 2022. I think he did an amazing job, as the O&A show's lore is a very deep rabbit hole. I'd also like to thank the D-Man and everyone else on O&A forums that helped me research this iceberg. I should, however, note that this iceberg does not tell the full winding story that is the O&A rabbit hole, as I unfortunately don't have time to cover the full depth of its insanity. With that out of the way, let's dive into the Opie and Anthony Iceberg. Level 1. The Sky a.k.a. the Bobo Level. Boston Mayor False Death Report This entry refers to a controversial April Fool's prank that Opie and Anthony pulled on April 1, 1998. At the time, the duo show was on rock radio station WAF, located in Boston. O and A stopped their show to make a serious announcement to listeners that the mayor of Boston, Tom Menino, had just been killed in a car accident in Florida. They would later go on to claim that Menino was accompanied by a Haitian prostitute during the accident and swore to listeners they weren't pulling an April Fool's joke. This radio bit, meant to be a shocking prank, rocked the city of Boston, as many took the news seriously. Word quickly began to spread that the mayor had died, with people believing it to be terrifyingly true. The mayor's own family was allegedly impacted by this prank, and once it was revealed to be an April Fool's joke, Many expressed their outrage with what Opie and Anthony had done. You weren't imagining it. It was an April Fool's hoax by two radio disc jockeys. Tonight, those DJs are apologizing to the mayor. But as News 4's David Robichaud tells us, Mr. Menino's not interested in apologies. One of my relatives was uh, just coming out of the hospital, and she was, somebody called and asked her, um, could we do anything for your family during this tra tragedy? And, uh, you know, she was shocked. My daughter, my wife, and um, a lot of my personal friends call the officer, and my staff is some of their crying. Can anyone take a joke anymore? On April Fool's Day, WAAF DJs Opie and Anthony, who like to refer to themselves as demented, told their listeners Mayor Menino had been killed in a car accident. At the time it aired, the mayor's wife, Angela, thought her husband was in a car on the way to the airport, so she thought it was true. The aftermath of this April Fool's joke would become known as the first notorious scandal that Opie and Anthony found themselves embroiled in. As a result of it, the duo were fired from WAF in Boston. A short time later, however, the New York radio station When You would hire the duo to continue their show, although their contracts would include a no-pranks clause to prevent something like the Boston mayor death hoax from happening again. Jocktober Jocktober was a recurring segment on Opie and Anthony during its later years, occurring annually throughout the month of October. During the segment, ONA's hosts would listen to various morning radio shows from around the country, with the goal of finding the worst and most cliched ones possible. They would proceed to mock and mercilessly ridicule the shows while on air. In some editions of Jocktober, Opie and Anthony would even mock past segments of their own radio broadcasts. 
It's Jocktober. Jocktober. A celebration of all things shitty in radio. It's not very nice. It's not very nice. Fantastic failures of pontificating proportion. You're so bad. Wow. An interactive exploration of what makes radio rancid. Jocktober. Hosts, holes, bits, and stunt boys. This isn't funny. It's time for Jock. October. I got a tree on my house. No, it's great. Wow. Oh, yeah. Jocktober would become an O and A fan favorite for its mean humor, and the fact the show's listeners would get to participate by targeting the social media pages of Jocktober shows, often spamming them with troll posts and shocking, not safe for work images until they were set to private or closed down. Sex for Sam. Sex for Sam was another controversial radio bit that would land Opie and Anthony in hot water in the early 2000s. A yearly segment that the duo started in 2000, Sex for Sam was a contest sponsored by the Samuel Adams beer brand and held every August. During the contest, couples would try to earn points by having sex in public places, accompanied by comedians who would call in to narrate their escapades and report back to O and A what was happening. Opie and Anthony would take the comedian's calls on air at the studio and tally the competitor's points, with the goal being for competitors to have sex in the most shocking and public places possible. The third annual Sex for Sam, however, would be the last. Comedian Paul Mercurio and the couple he was assigned to report on, Brian Florence and Loretta Harper, would end up at the St. Patrick's Cathedral, a historic New York City landmark. The couple would proceed to have sex on the floor in the foyer of the church, feet away from a Catholic service that was being held inside. This ultimately lead to Mercurio and the couple's arrest for public lewdness after witnesses caught the trio and held them there for the police. All right, let's go to Paul and the Juicy Lips before we take a break. His team is representing D.C. today, Marshall and Lynn. What's up, uh, Paul? We're in St. Pat's, and he's doing the balloon knot inside, and a security guy is coming up to us right now. Oh. All right, all right, all right. Hey, come on, let him go. They're okay there. No, let him go. He was just looking for the restroom. That's all. Well. No, no, no. I need to the restroom. What's the problem? Come to the house, that please. I well, you the restroom? Yeah, no, they were, just, they were just looking for the restroom. I thought the door was open. I'm talking to them. Well, I can talk to them. Yeah, you can talk to them. Talk to the south side. All right, listen, we'll, uh, we'll just split. All right, we'll go. No, they we'll right go. In. Who's coming right in? I can't even use the restroom. Listen, you just need to use the restroom. Don't be so, what are you being so difficult for? Oh, my God. Listen, he would never, this is a sacrilegious place. He would never do anything like that. This is the Catholic Church. Hey, listen, you, you want to be arrested? You, you'll be quiet, all right? No, I'm not going to be quiet. I have a right to say whatever I want to say. Just because you have a blue jacket on with a patch on doesn't mean you have authority over me. You know that when they give you a walkie-talkie, that doesn't mean to take away my constitutional rights. We're going to go, all right? We can do whatever we want. We the stunt lead to media attention and a large public outcry, with WNEW issuing an apology the next day. The Catholic League rejected this apology and demanded Opie and Anthony be fired from the station for allowing the bit to happen. A short time later, Opie and Anthony were both fired from WNEW, and around a year later, Brian Florence of the contestant couple would die of a heart attack. His partner, Loretta Harper, and comedian Paul Mercurio were both convicted of disorderly conduct a short time later. This radio stunt led to over 500 letters of complaint being written to the FCC. Following this, Infinity, WNEW's owner, was fined $357,000 for the incident. Infinity later appealed this fine, though Infinity's parent company, Viacom, ultimately paid a $3.5 million settlement as a result of the incident and the FCC indecency violations it resulted in. Following this incident, Opie and Anthony's show was cancelled, but they were both still stuck in their contracts with Infinity, which prevented them from continuing their show on another station. While Infinity could have released them from their contracts, they instead continued to pay them until their deals expired in June 2004 in order to prevent them broadcasting on another station. This proved to be a frustrating time for Opie and Anthony as they were forced off the air until 2004. 
The sex for Sam stunt is one of the scandals that affected Opie and Anthony the most, as they were left with a two-year setback and no choice but to wait out their contracts. Trolling celebrity guests, trolling celebrity guests, refers to the fact Opie and Anthony would often troll big-name celebrities on their show. Known for their mean sense of humor, O and A had many moments with celebrities that were less than friendly. In one instance, O and A would have actress Kristen Bell on to promote a movie she was starring in. Opie, however, would hang up on Kristen mid-sentence at the very beginning of their conversation on air. We got to interrupt this uh, news story. We got a, a a big star on the on the on the phone. Kristen Bell, the uh, the star of Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Kristen. Yes. Congratulations on the new movie. Are you excited? I'm so excited. Awesome. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh. So. Uh, oh. So. Uh, <laughs> So oh, let's... Roland is in cardiac <laughs> arrest. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Best celebrity oh, yeah. interview ever. Oh, ever. Yeah. Oh, man. O and A had spats with numerous other celebrities, including Tommy Lee, Sarah Jessica Parker, and former Minnesota governor and professional wrestler Jesse Ventura. These incidents led to O and A gaining a reputation for their edgy and often mean interactions with celebrities. When your country calls, you're there. Hey, I've never been in the military, so you're brave, I'm a coward, I have no right, we got it. Stop. Did I say that? Y yes, you did, through implication. You, uh. We all speak this, we have the commonality of language, so you can't say, did I say that, when you say something. To me. Uh, you did it to me? You said I don't believe in the Constitution. Bye, guys. Bye, Jess. Governor. Why don't you sulk and walk away, why? No, you, you put not, words in my hey, mouth. Hey, there's a fucking guy here telling me I got a schedule, asshole. He's using dirty language, asshole. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Bye, tough guy. Bye, tough guy. <laughs> and thanks for your service to our country. You're welcome. Thanks for touching me with your fucking stupid rip riffraff and fucking Rocky Horror hairdo. <laughs> You're bigger than me and stronger than me, so what? I don't give a shit. <laughs> you want to beat me up? Go ahead. Oh, I'm not going to fight a guy like you. I, that means nothing to me. I know. I argued with you, you put words in my mouth, and you didn't like when I did it to you. You put words in my mouth saying, I didn't believe in the Constitution, and that's bullshit. It's not true. I don't agree with uh, uh, abusing it. Thank you for your service. To oh, you're welcome. You're a bigger patriot than me. Godspeed. Get the fuck out of here. Joe Rogan Inspiration Joe Rogan Inspiration refers to statements Joe Rogan has made in the past, regarding the fact Opie and Anthony was part of what inspired him to create his own podcast, The Joe Rogan Experience, which later went on to be one of the most successful and well-known podcasts of all time. Joe has previously stated that O and A's open discussion style was influential on JRE, and that Anthony Cumia's past live streams from his home studio, known as Live from the Compound, also inspired Joe to build his own home studio to broadcast from. While Joe's podcast is quite different from O&A, there's no doubt the radio show left a lasting impression on Rogan. That completes level one of the Opie and Anthony Iceberg. Now it's time to move on to level two, the surface level, also known as the Opie's Man Tits level. Walkover Shows Walkover Shows refers to a unique feature that was once part of Opie and Anthony's broadcast schedule. At one period during the show's history, O&A was on FM radio at the start of the day, before going over to an XM radio studio to broadcast during the latter part of the day. XM radio, if you weren't aware, was a satellite radio service that was once popular in the early 2000s. As FCC's rules didn't apply to satellite radio, XM had uncensored broadcasts, and Opie and Anthony would begin to air on XM from 2004 onward. As they walked from the FM radio studio to XM studios, Opie and Anthony would carry microphones and radio equipment to broadcast their so-called walkover shows on air as they walked through New York City. These shows were known for their spontaneity, with the hosts regularly interacting with pedestrians, fans, and homeless people they passed by. This segment was well known among fans, as it added an interesting element to the show, as anything could happen on the streets of New York, and it led to many interesting interactions 
some of which would become well-known scandals of their own. Cake Stomp Cake Stomp refers to an incident that occurred during one of Opie and Anthony's aforementioned walkover shows, where the hosts would broadcast their walk through the streets of New York between studios. The incident, which happened in 2006, would later be remembered as one of the most controversial and well-known moments in the show's history. During their walkover broadcast, Opie and Anthony would come across a homeless man named Andrew, whom they had encountered on walkover shows in the past and interacted with regularly. The hosts often talked to Andrew and supposedly even gave him money in the past. On the day of this incident, however, Owen A. found Andrew sitting on the sidewalk with a cake that someone had given to him as a gift. After talking with him briefly out of nowhere, Opie began to jump and stomp on the cake, much to Andrew's dismay. You eat it, Andrew. Hey, no, it it's some kind of a cinnamon no. um, um, cakey thing. No. Oh. Oh. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, that's why I love you guys. That's why I love you guys. You know, I earned that. While Owen A's hosts laughed at this cruel joke, many people who later saw the video thought it wasn't very funny. This video of Opie stomping on the cake was shared online and has since circulated the internet several millions of times, with many reacting in outrage at Opie's actions. To this day, the video reappears regularly and is believed to be one of the most damaging incidents to his public image throughout his entire career. Grape Fight The Grape Fight is a well-known argument that occurred between Opie and Anthony in March of 2009. What began as a trivial matter, Anthony Cumia eating grapes while on the show, eventually escalated into a tense on-air argument between Opie and Anthony. This fight revealed some of the underlying tensions the pair were hiding, as they had been doing radio together for over a decade at this point, and were both secretly drifting apart as a silent conflict grew between them. A lot of people... Grapes. You want to eat grapes and we'll do this after the break? No, okay. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people have had... Why don't you eat yogurt? <laughs> huh? I don't do that anymore. I know, I just I started. I really don't. <laughs> I realize that it's annoying, so I, I, I just like do it on the side. Um, All right, in 12 years, you could yell at me. Well, <laughs> uh, whatever. Come on, I'm fucking around. You're in a bad fucking mood. I told you I am. I know, but don't let it affect the days. fucking show. You're in a bad has fucking it? mood. Has it the last two days? Yes, it has. No, it hasn't. You've been in a cranky fucking mm -hmm. mood. I understand we've been fired from fucking CBS yeah. and shit, but let me tell you something. The grape fight is remembered by fans as a significant moment in the show's history and one of many turning points in the duo's long and rocky relationship. Lady Di Last Phone Call Lady Di, whose real name is Diana Orbani, was a frequent caller and guest on the Opie, an Anthony show that is well remembered by many fans. Lady Di was an older woman who was known for being an eccentric alcoholic with a tragic background, and she had many humorous interactions with O and As hosts and guests. At one point, O and A even brought Lady Di on to do an internship for them as a bit she would frequently interrupt the show to ask banal questions or reveal odd and perplexing tidbits about her own personal life. Lady Di's last call refers to the last phone call Lady Di ever made into the O&A radio show, although technically she was calling Opie and Jim, as this occurred after Anthony Cumia was fired from Sirius XM. Anthony's firing would result in the Opie and Anthony show becoming Opie and Jim. While Lady Di was a regular caller in the past, her calls eventually became less and less frequent, and many O&A listeners speculated that she had began to suffer from health problems and possibly alcohol-related dementia. This would be confirmed when Lady Di called in for the first time in the while, with some strange and worrying news. She would tell Opie and Jim Norton that she was on a Navy ship, that she was awaiting orders from the Navy, and that she'd been serving for around ten years. Opie and Jim found this concerning, as she sounded completely serious and appeared to be confused and suffering from an episode of dementia. That record did. You guys owe me five bucks each. Lady Diamond's bet. More importantly, where are you? A lot of people are very concerned about you. Uh, me and Jimmy kind of know I'm what's on, going on. I am on a ship right now, waiting for my duties right now. Oh, Holy. you're on a ship? Yes, I am. Which, which ship is it? Oh. Does it rhyme with my manic? 
It's a ship that's <laughs> on the ocean. What ship? It's a, it's a Navy ship. It's a Navy ship. You're on a Navy ship right now? Yeah. Well, what, what, what ship did you think I was on? Oh, we didn't know. No one told us. Yeah, we heard rumors that, you know, you were away or something, and now we're finding out that you're on a Navy well, ship. Well, technically, I am away. I, I'm away from my apartment. Where are you? Uh, I'm on a ship. But do you, where is, you that. Where's the ship, though? Hold on a second. Where where, where we got that? Where we got that? Where? All right, well, you know, we're docked somewhere, but we're still in the United States. Oh, okay. Are you, know. you, are you doing all right? Yeah, I could be a lot better. You know, I could be uh, more awake than what I usually am. Usually, usually at this time, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lot more awake, you know. Yeah. But I've been having, like, you know, dreams at night. I wake up in the middle of the night, and, you know, it's not really, not really that good. You know what I mean? That's mm. what happens when you're in the Navy. Sometimes. Sure. How long have you been in the you know, Navy? I've been in the Navy technically around 10 years. Okay, so you're just docked now at, at your docked uh, from coming back from a, a trip or deployment? Um, well, well, you know, this ship just went around the United States. Sadly, this call would be the last time anyone from O and A would hear from Lady Di, as she seems to have succumbed to memory loss from her years of alcoholism and drug use. This confusing and bizarre call would be a brutal and tragic ending to Lady Di's part in the Opie and Anthony universe. Live from the Compound Live from the Compound was an online show Anthony Cumia hosted from the home studio he built in his basement during his time at Sirius XM. The show started in 2012 and was broadcast on the platform Ustream, where Anthony would often drink and discuss a variety of topics as well as feature various segments like Drunk Karaoke. In 2014, after being fired from Sirius XM, Anthony would retire, live from the compound, and launch a new online show broadcast from the same studio called The Anthony Cumia Show. This was a live uncensored internet show that Anthony hosted on a paid subscription platform he created called Compound Media a short time after he was fired. Anthony Weiner Dick Pickleek. Anthony Weiner Dick Pickleek refers to an incident that occurred on the Opie and Anthony show in 2011. While conservative blogger and journalist Andrew Breitbart was a guest on the Opie and Anthony show, he would present the hosts with a leaked nude picture of Congressman Weiner. The picture was captured by Sirius XM studio cameras and broadcast to viewers, and was also tweeted out by Anthony Cumia. Breitbart would later say he didn't intend for the pictures to be publicized on the Internet and that he was mortified by the incident. This would later tie into a long-running sex scandal involving Anthony Weiner, and it was widely covered in the media at the time it occurred. Weiner was the center of a salacious sex scandal that the media and officials had tried to cover up prior to the leaked images surfacing, and it is undoubtedly an unforgettable moment in the show's history. Brother Joe... Brother Joe is the nickname given to Anthony Cumia's brother, Joseph Cumia. Joe was a frequent caller and guest on the Opie and Anthony show, and even claims partial credit for the creation of the Opie and Anthony show. In 1994, Anthony and Joe Cumia would appear as guests on Opie's radio show, The Nighttime Attitude, after they won a contest Opie was holding for best parody song about the O.J. Simpson murder trial. Joe has long held an interest in music, and aspired to be a famous musician, and him and Anthony would often work on parody songs together before the Opie and Anthony show existed. I really loved that girl. Joe Cumia later gained a notorious reputation on the internet following the end of the Opie and Anthony show, and he was regularly trolled by the Opie and Anthony subreddit for several years, gaining status as a sort of lol cow among O and A fans. For many O and A listeners, Joe Cumia is a memorable character that rode Anthony's coattails for many years. 
We've completed covering the surface, so now it's time to dive a step further into the shallow depths of Level 3, also known as the Antoine Cumia level. Bra bombing, bra bombing refers to an early Opie and Anthony segment that took place while the duo were at WAAF in Boston. In retaliation to recent drama involving a segment on Opie and Anthony's Real Rock TV on WABU, O&A performed a bit where they claimed to be dressed in military regalia and flying in war balloons above the city of Boston, armed with several bras holding paint balloons. Opie and Anthony claimed they were flying over WABU's building and dropping the paint-filled bras on WABU in retaliation. The bit is a cringe and over-the-top segment that happened early in Opie and Anthony's broadcast history and is fondly remembered by the hosts, who years later replayed tape of the bit so they and guest comedians could rip on it and joke about how awful it was. Well, you, uh, what was it, ABU or ABU, right? Uh, they took the show off the air and they were about to rue that decision. Opie and Anthony <laughs> got a, uh, a blimp and we're going to drop paint-filled bra bombs on the station. Bra bombs, yeah. Bra bombs, yeah, that's uh, what we were armed with. Um, well, because we were uh, collecting bras. Twelve years ago. Twelve years ago, 1996. Which, we, <laughs> which isn't that long ago. We are in the air. <laughs> I know. I think we're on the air, bro. It's Opie and Anthony. We are heading for our aerial assault. We're about 600 feet off the ground, over the Charles River, heading out of Boston, <laughs> heading toward our target. Don't look at me like crazy. that, Jimmy. People are looking up and waving at us, man. This thing is unreal. We're in a hot air. Really waving. They're waving goodbye <laughs> yeah. off yeah. the Boston airwaves. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think it goes to waving with one finger. <laughs> <laughs> We're in a hot air blimp. This thing is really small, and we're on a bombing mission, man. We're gonna bomb ABU. You gotta love that, man. <laughs> what the heck is Anthony and Danny Periscope Leaks. Anthony and Danny Periscope Leaks refers to a domestic incident that occurred between Anthony Cumia and his then girlfriend, Danielle Brand. The incident was captured in a Periscope video live streamed by Danny, who claimed that Anthony had broken her hand. Both appear intoxicated in the video, and it's evident they had gotten into a physical altercation shortly beforehand, with Anthony attacking her at one point before the video starts. Anthony can also be heard in the background drunkenly shouting in distress as he searches his house for a lost handgun that he dropped while intoxicated. Anthony is well known for his obsession with firearms and evidently would even carry one in a holster while getting drunk inside his house. Don't. Hi, I'm in Long Island. I got my hand broken. I'm waiting for the police to come, Where but is my. Oh my god, don't hit me again. I'm hitting you. Stay away from me. I what? tried to call the police. He turned the phone off. You shouldn't have lied then. You shouldn't have lied, and you shouldn't have hit me, and you shouldn't have treated me like shit, and then I wouldn't be periscoping this right now. leave my house, I'm asking, I'll pay to have you go back to the... I don't need you to pay for a car. I need you to pay for my fucking broken hand, you dumb right. piece of shit. But you're moving your hands. What are you talking about? This is beautiful. So glad that you guys saw this, but uh, just so you can see some other shit. Uh, right there. And then, uh, right there. So, um, oh, and then on my boob, too. But you won't be so lucky to see that. Uh, this is wonderful. Wonderful bubble kid, Mitch. Yeah! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Anthony and Danny show. Oh, never put my name with yours, you racist bigot. Stay away from me, you fucking psycho! <laughs> Come on, baby! Oh my god, isn't this great? You find me all the time. I've already, what? Up I've already uploaded all your- Sweetie, where the fuck is my gun? <laughs> fuck! Anthony was later arrested for the incident and charged with strangulation in the second degree, unlawful imprisonment in the second degree, assault in the third degree, and criminal mischief in the third and fourth degree. He would later plead guilty to third-degree assault and blocking someone's airway in Nassau County Court, 
with the condition he attend six months of outpatient alcohol treatment and a batterer's intervention program. His charges were later reduced to simple harassment as a result of him completing his treatments. This incident has since become a well-known meme among many Opie and Anthony fans due to the drama surrounding it. Antoine Cumia Antoine Cumia refers to a prank that was pulled by an O and A fan following the 2016 Bastille Day terrorist attack in Nietzsche, France. Shortly after the attack occurred, a fan would post an old image of Anthony Cumia to social media, claiming it was a picture of the perpetrator of the attack and that he was an Islamic terrorist by the name of Antoine Cumia. The tweet quickly began to circulate in the chaos following the attacks, with many readers believing it to be factual information. Several news outlets in Europe even reported it as news, broadcasting the picture of Anthony on television and telling viewers that he was the man behind the attack. Anthony later talked about the incident on the Anthony Cumia show, apparently amused by what had unfolded. Before we go, did you show Bobby what you did last Thursday? Uh, let me, let me think. It's up. On, it'll be up on the monitor. Oh, okay. Let's uh, let's say. Oh, what the fuck! Who is this? That? Was a huge uh, event. Let's uh, just just freeze it at the beginning of the clip first. Let me explain. Fucking Gene Simmons with AIDS. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, all right, not the funniest thing I've seen. Um, let, okay. <laughs> Play it through and then I'll explain. Go ahead with the volume. Șoferul camionului, îl vedeți în imagini pe cel care a fost identificat cel puțin până acum de poliția franceză ca fiind autorul acestui atac. Șoferul camionului a tras de volan spre grupul de români. Erau 16 români în acea în acel moment pe pe faleză în grupul în care se afla doamna Rugină și în momentul în care i-a văzut că speriați se dau la o parte fug Doamna Rugină și-a luat copilul în brațe și a fugit înspre plajă, a redresat camionul spre stânga și a continuat să se deplaseze cu... Yeah, this was a big thing that happened uh, over the weekend. Of course, tragedy struck uh, Nice, France, when a psychopath in a truck decided to mow down and uh, kill 84 people. And Unbelievable. Scores more. Unbelievable. Um, well, of course, the... the the want of everybody to know who did this it was all over the place. Someone on social media decided to take a picture of me from 1980-something yeah. <laughs> and post it as the guy that did it. Well, it had legs, and all over Europe, on all their newscasts, You're the guy? I'm the fucking terrorist. Oh, my God. And they finally... Scorch Mentoring Sam Scorch Mentoring Sam is a reference to Sam Roberts, an intern and later producer on The Opie and Anthony Show, and his relationship to Scorch, a character who Opie and Anthony would keep up with and often ridicule. Scorch was the host of PFG TV, a low-budget internet show that was formatted similar to many late-night shows, though on a much lower budget. Prior to working on Opie and Anthony, Sam Roberts is said to have worked with Scorch in the past, something he would discuss during Scorch segments on the show. Sam was often able to provide insider insights into PFG TV and the exaggerations and lies Scorch supposedly made, such as claims that PFG TV was highly successful and that it was syndicated internationally. Scorch is a hilarious and memorable character, and O&A segments featuring the hosts reacting to him and his online show would be one of the many recurring bits remembered by fans. On another exciting episode, international dancing sensation Lacey Ray. Also an exclusive interview and performance by Yuletide Metal Super Show, Trans-Siberian Orchestra. You may recognize him from his many TV oh. shows and commercials. Actor comedian what? Matty Blake. Many TV Walk shows. Your daughters and hide your wives. Oh, it's Scorch's co-host, Sim Hashian. So let's make some noise for your oh, show's oh, oh, no. Listen to the fake. Yeah. Piped in applause. What a show tonight, because as Shelly said, tonight we've got international nice known dancer uh, Lacey Rain, which is amazing. Oh my God. $10,000 Fugitive The $10,000 Fugitive refers to a radio bit that has been used by numerous shows in the past as a way to generate publicity 
and give away cash prizes or concert tickets. The scenario typically goes that a fugitive supposedly broke into the radio station and stole something, for example $10,000, and they're now on the run. The fugitive calls in disguising their voice and gives clues to their identity while the radio DJ plays along, and whatever listener can solve the puzzle and track down the fugitive wins the prize. The Fugitive is a tired and cliched radio bit, and Opie and Anthony have mocked and ridiculed several different shows that ran bits like this in the past. However, at one point, O and A themselves would be struck by a mysterious fugitive who shockingly stole $10,000 from their studio. The fugitive would call in to give hints about his identity, though at one point he forgot to disguise his voice after a dog walked by, revealing his identity as none other than the dim-witted Bobo, a.k.a. Daniel Curlin, who was a recurring guest on the Opie and Anthony show throughout the 2000s. This bit is well-remembered and loved by Owen of fans, as the build-up before Bobo blows the bit by dropping the voice made for entertaining radio. Anthony, we got someone very mysterious on the phone line. Uh-oh. They're not giving their name. They're very mysterious. Oh, what time is it? <laughs> uh, hello, sir. Yeah, you're gonna have cola. I have stolen ten thousand dollars from Mel Carsistan. <laughs> you stole ten thousand dollars from where? Mel Carsistan. From Mel the... Mel Carsistan. Mel Carsistan. Who's Mel Carsistan? I'm in charge of the company. I have stolen money. If you want it back, I have to humiliate Sam Roberts, light his hair on fire. <laughs> Wow, is this... Wait, you're going to light this, Sam's <laughs> hair on fire if we don't do what? No, oh, you guys have to do it if you want the money back. <laughs> is this the fugitive? <laughs> oh, no, it's the fugitive, Anthony. If we want the money back, we got to set Sam Roberts' hair on fire. That sounds a little dangerous. Yeah, yeah fugitive. fugitive, that's scary. Uh, oh, or, or dump peanut butter on it and gum... <laughs> Why would we... You can't dump peanut butter on somebody, Fugitive. That's very hard to yeah. do. Uh, you could put gum on it. Gum. Gum in Sam Roberts' hair, and then we get the money back, Fugitive? Yeah. Well, you know how this works. Uh, uh, it, when they do it at other stations, you need to give us a clue of who you are. Yeah, of who you are, so we can find the, the Fugitive. So yeah. give uh, us a clue. Uh, I was born in, Booth, in what was... What is now known as New York Hospital Queens. Back then it was called Booth Memorial Hospital. <laughs> Boy, I don't know who the fugitive is. Do you, it? No. Wow. Could we ask for another clue, fugitive? Yeah, one more clue. I graduated Hillcrest High School. Where? Hillcrest High School. Where is that? Yeah, where is that? That's in Jamaica, Queens. Everything is Queens. <laughs> He's never left Queens. Uh, uh, a fugitive. Can can I ask you, um, what what borough of New York do you live in now? Uh, I live in Queens. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's happening, fugitive? Yeah, what happened, fugitive? No, 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 nothing. Nothing. I actually, the dog had just walked a little bit too. too the dog walked a little bit too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, listen. Holy <laughs> shit! To the faithful listeners, turn Holy off the show. God. It's not going to get any funnier than that Holy moment God. right there. Oh my God. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> oh, you can't write shit like that. There is nobody. This is, a, this is a perfect day to check out other channels at SiriusXM because we're done. We can't beat that. Holy shit. Fugitive, what happened? Oh, never mind. That's the door. The dog just walked ahead of me right before I was about to start crossing. Oh, okay. Wow, we just learned something new. <laughs> scared shitless of dogs. Oh, are no, you? No, 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 the dog was scared. The dog, oh, the dog was dog scared of the scared. fugitive? No, no, the dog was scared. Something just scared the dog. That's it.
O and A stealing bits from Scorch. This entry appears to reference a supposed conspiracy theory that Opie and Anthony actually got many of their ideas from Scorch's PFG TV. I couldn't find much info on this topic while researching it online, and I suspect it was included in the iceberg as a joke. However, I will say that Scorch is a PFG guy, so there's a possibility that this one is actually true. YouTube Documentaries This entry refers to the numerous YouTube documentaries that have been made over Opie and Anthony and related characters in recent years. YouTubers such as Beige Frequency, Porcelain, among others, have become quite popular among many O and A fans online. A podcast about the history of the O and A show called Shock Jocks also covered the radio show story in quite a bit of detail. That completes level three, the Antoine Cumia level. Now we can finally dive into the depths and see what's lurking down below in level four, also known as the Drunk Opie level. Yeah. Favorite line <laughs> coming up. Oh boy. Hey, what's happening, man? It's Opie. We're up here skiing in Maine, having a great time. We had one hell of a party last night. Check out the empties, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Check out the empties, man. And there's the most <laughs> staged fucking... The People's Court episode. The People's Court episode refers to an episode of the television show The People's Court that featured Anthony's brother Joe Cumia. The episode centers around a legal dispute that Joe had gotten into with a bar owner after Joe's gig was canceled. At the time, Joe was a member of a U2 cover band called 2U, and the group would occasionally perform at various venues in New Jersey and the surrounding areas. Around this same time, Opie and Anthony's subreddit trolls had began sending screenshots of racist social media posts authored by Joe to various venues in order to troll Joe and get his shows canceled. During the episode, Joe argued to the judge that he had entered a written contract with the venue that could not be canceled, and he even tried and failed to convince her that the screenshots of his racist posts were photoshopped, the judge was clearly not phased by Joe's trolling claims, and she would go on to question his racist behavior, as well as a widely publicized racist incident that got Joe's brother Anthony fired from Sirius XM. In the end, though, Joe ultimately won the case due to a technicality involving the fact he had signed a binding contract with the venue. However, the episode ended up making him look like the bad guy, as his racist behavior was brought up by the judge, who dismissed Joe's claims about trolls and expressed her discomfort with his racist tweets. This incident would end up being another win for Opie and Anthony Trolls, as they not only got Joe's gigs cancelled, but also watched him get humiliated and outed as a racist on national television as a result. As I mentioned previously, Brother Joe is a sort of lol cow among Opie and Anthony fans, as they have trolled him and followed his antics online for many years. This is the plaintiff, Joseph Cumia. Uh uh, um, uh, uh, tribute band. They, uh, um, it's, it's half acting, Who half musicianship. Bono? Well, um, uh, he had mentioned being informed of, uh, uh, pedophile, racist, pedophile, misogynist, pedophile, homophobe, pedophile, tweets, a, um, uh, 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 right. It's just misogynistic yes. pedophile. That gentleman is you. That is correct. So I, I, um, um, I, uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, uh, I, uh, a card-carrying violent white supremacist pedophile. That's that's really what uh, what it comes down to. And, um, um, I, I I did a, a bit of pedophile investigating, and it's an ongoing problem that I've had. The plaintiff was a racist. I was unaware of his affiliation with uh, his brother, who's a radio personality, so he was somewhat- Who's the brother? Uh, Anthony Cumia. Anthony was uh, dismissed from the show last, uh, yeah, in 2014. And he was dismissed from the show for what reasons? Um, there, was a, there was an issue with a pedophile on a, a, a Sirius XM satellite radio. Um, um, uh, but, um, uh, um, pedophile screen grabs are easily manipulated, and I can tell you which ones are genuine screen grabs and are not. It's coming from a hosting site called Imager. Imager is a hosting site 
wherein any pedophile can post pretty much anything. How do that, you know it's coming from Imager? In no uncertain terms, I can answer for each and every one of those proudly. But, um, uh, uh, it's not just one guy. If, if you'd be kind enough to take a look. It's, it's a, uh, it's a... Ant calls Opie post breakup. Ant calls Opie post breakup refers to a phone call that Anthony made to Opie on air following Anthony's firing from Sirius XM. Prior to the call, Opie and Anthony had a very public falling out after Anthony was fired from Sirius XM. Anthony was fired after an incident in 2014 that took place in Times Square. In the early hours of the morning, Anthony was apparently roaming Times Square with his camera, supposedly taking pictures of the city. At one point, however, he was evidently attacked by a black prostitute in the street who thought he was taking pictures of her. Immediately afterwards, Anthony took to Twitter, outraged at what he had just experienced. He proceeded to go on a long, racist tirade against black people, writing several hateful and racial slur-filled tweets, and even going as far as to claim, quote, they aren't people. Following this racist social media outburst and the negative publicity it garnered, Anthony was fired from Sirius XM and the Opie and Anthony show. This incident would prove to be the breaking point in Opie and Anthony's relationship, as tensions between them had grown in previous years and they were quietly drifting apart, ultimately to the point they were only speaking with each other during the show. Following their breakup, Anthony would call Opie for the first time in two years, while Opie was on air. Opie and Anthony would reminisce and talk about their time together on the show, and some of the things that led to their split. Anthony would also talk about his recent domestic violence charges and the time he spent in rehab, remarking that it was, quote, pretty fun, but that he was done dating crazy girls for a while. I'll move on. Take some calls. Take some calls? All right. God damn. We got uh, HG from Long Island. Hello. Hello? Who's Hello. this? Is, is this the uh, OP show? <laughs> <laughs> For the first time in how long? Two years, two years? three months. It's Anthony Cumia. Greg Opie Hughes, ladies and gentlemen, on, on my fucking show. Wow. This is crazy. I don't is think this, I should be here right now. Is that really uh, Anthony? Uh, Wait, who's, uh, who are you on with? Mercurial of all. Oh, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, yeah. There's somebody. Anthony would also talk about how he believed Opie did not try very hard to save Anthony's job with many fans believing Opie could have stopped Anthony from being fired had he stepped in. Opie would respond by claiming that he did all that he could to prevent the firing and keep the show together, though Anthony and many listeners doubt this is true. This call is well remembered among many more hardcore O and A fans, as it was some of the first public correspondence between Opie and Anthony in the two years after Anthony's firing. Steve C. Funeral Attendees Steve C. Funeral Attendees, refers to the funeral of Steve Carlsey, who served as program director and executive producer on Opie and Anthony for over 12 years. Carlsey was well known by fans and regularly appeared on O&A. Early in O&A's history, Steve was who took the initiative to give the show an internet presence and created many things behind the scenes for O&A. Steve also ran FoundryMusic.com, a website that would be mentioned on O&A regularly as well, and was known for being difficult to navigate and plastered with an excessive amount of foundry music watermarks. Tragically, Steve C. passed away in 2012 after he took his own life. While this would devastate the O&A show, many fans have laid blame on O&A's hosts and show producer Sam Roberts for supposedly playing a part in Steve's death. According to many fans, O&A mercilessly harassed and mocked Steve prior to his death, and some believe the way he was treated on the show contributed to his eventual suicide. However, it's worth noting that the O&A show did host a memorial segment in honor of Steve C., and had some somber moments reflecting on the time he had spent working for them. On a later episode of O&A, Opie would reveal that Anthony and Jimmy didn't attend the funeral, despite the fact Steve had worked with the show for over a decade, which rubbed many fans the wrong way. The Pests the Pests is a nickname that refers to Opie and Anthony's most dedicated fans, who were also known as the O&A Army. 
These fans were notorious for the proactive approach they often took in supporting the Opie and Anthony show. Many actively participated in the show not only by listening and calling in, but also by carrying out pranks and stunts on O and A's behalf. The O and A pests quickly gained a notorious reputation as wild and rambunctious trolls that often sought to provoke as many people as possible. Many O and A pests would also disrupt live news and media broadcasts as part of Opie and Anthony's assault on the media, where they encouraged their fans to interrupt live broadcasts and cause chaos in the media wherever they could. This resulted in several memorable incidents unfolding on live television. Town author, good morning. Good morning, Sean. This is apparently a very simple crime to commit. All one has to do is buy a couple of multi uh, buy multiple metro cards, stand at the turnstile, and just continuously swipe people in all day. Police sources say these guys net a couple hundred dollars a day, and that's pure profit. But it's costing the TA a great deal, about sixteen million dollars a year, and they're trying to put a stop to it. What the fuck is your problem, man? Oh, and a fan on to catch a predator. O and A fan on to catch a predator refers to an incident where an O and A fan was caught in a sting on the television show To Catch a Predator. If you weren't aware, To Catch a Predator was a highly successful show hosted by Chris Hansen in the early 2000s that followed law enforcement as they sought and arrested internet predators who were trying to meet up with children online. One of the men caught trying to meet an underaged girl would mention to Chris Hansen that he loved his interview on Opie and Anthony. O and A would bring Chris Hansen on again to discuss this incident a short time later. While many radio shows would have tried to hide the fact one of their fans was a child predator featured on a recent TV program, Opie and Anthony proudly covered the story on the air and turned the incident into a humorous situation, riffing and cracking jokes about it with Chris Hansen in studio. Keep your hands right where I can see them, okay? And I want you to sit right down there. No, keep your hands, keep your hands right where I can see them, all right? What is this right here? Some pot. Some pot. And what was your <laughs> plan tonight? Want to come down, you know? Come talk down. to her. Talk to her. You're Chris Hansen? I am. Have you seen this show? <laughs> you have seen it. I thought you were real funny on Opie and Anthony. <laughs> oh, you, you listen to me on Opie and Anthony? <laughs> Can I honestly tell you something? Yeah, I, I almost think in the back of my mind that I almost wanted this to happen. Oh my! Oh. I think the beauty is that not only is he is a potential pedophile, but he does drugs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is great. He's smoking pot. He's offering pot to the youngster. Yeah, and uh, trying to have sex with the youngster. And uh, he's a fan of the program. Ah, that's welcome. Wonderful. Welcome, sponsors. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes. Are you Jesus. kidding me? Why not? You were funny on. Big J Roast Bombing Big J Roast Bombing refers to an incident that occurred with Anthony Cumia in 2015 at the roast of stand-up comedian Big J Okerson. Hosted by Roastmaster Kurt Metzger, the roast featured several comedians brought on to roast Big J, including Anthony Cumia. However, Anthony's set at the roast is not remembered by fans for its wit and humor, but instead for its bizarre and racist content that seemed focused more on race than it did comedy. During Anthony's segment of the roast, Impractical Joker's cast member Sal Volcano can be seen making perplexed facial expressions in the background as Anthony rants about how it was the white man that took humanity to the moon, among other strange topics. The entire ordeal left many scratching their heads and wondering what was supposed to be funny about Anthony's roast material, with some worried he was growing increasingly senile and incapable of humor in his old age. While Anthony spent many years coming up with hilarious and clever things for the O&A show, it seems that the older he got, the more this talent sadly seemed to fade away. This bomb would be well known among many O&A fans, and clips of it were circulated online afterwards as well. Uh, this, next, uh, you, this next man has more hate in his heart than Dan Soder has voices in his act. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Anthony Cumia. Anthony Cumia, let him... Oh my God, that was good. What was that guy's name? That was uh, that was great. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, a lot of white people, uh, a lot of white people here today, right? Looks like uh, looks like in uh, 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 one of those uh, Black Lives Matter protests. They're all fucking white. 
This room's very diverse. It looks like the 50s space program. No? Yeah, uh, Sal, Impractical Jokers. Great, uh, great show. So original, said Alan Funt in 1965. It's a good one right there. And Voss, so glad Voss is here. That completes level four, the drunk Opie level. Now we can go even deeper into this iceberg to the fifth stage, a.k.a. the crying Jim Norton level. Let's see what lurks below. Ron Bennington talks with Compound Media. Ron Bennington talks with Compound Media refers to segments of the Anthony Cumia show that featured radio host Ron Bennington. Prior to Anthony's firing from Sirius XM, he worked with fellow radio host and comedian Ron Bennington on a regular basis. At the time, Ron was the host of another Sirius XM show that was closely related to Opie and Anthony, known as the Ron and Fez show. Airing on the same network, there was a lot of crossover between the two shows throughout the years, and Ron and Anthony clearly developed a special relationship, as the two were known to have good chemistry and be very funny when on air together. After being fired and starting Compound Media and the Anthony Cumia show, Anthony would have Ron Bennington on the show as a guest, and Ron would at moments briefly try to make serious, close-hearted conversation with Anthony about what was going on. As I mentioned in the previous entry, by this point in his life, Anthony had began to slip into his more racist tendencies, and according to many fans, he appeared to have been losing his comedic ambitions entirely. Ron, having known and worked alongside Anthony for many years, spoke honestly to him about what he saw was going on. I should note that Ron is pretty experienced with handling situations like these, as his co-host Fez Watley was known to be wildly emotionally unstable towards the later years of the show. Before. In what way? <laughs> I'm noticing uh, uh, family, friends, they're starting to use all the same kind of language. I think they're in cahoots with each other. I'm constantly waiting to come home to an intervention. <laughs> I, I don't think I, I don't think an intervention would work with you. Really? Because I don't think you ever think that you bottom out, and I'm not sure even if you're if the drinking has anything to do with it. I think the drinking is a uh, is a is a small part of a larger sign that mm. you got lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got lost somewhere along the way. I got lost. Yeah. You were the funniest out of everybody. See, now I do feel like I'm the ghost visiting. Oh, shit. You were the absolute funniest out of everyone. Uh-huh. That didn't give you pleasure. Hmm. Another appearance Ron made on the Anthony Cumia show would be remembered as much more tense exchange. This episode had Ron as a guest, but also featured author Colin Flaherty whose writing covers controversial topics including racial violence and crime in America. Flaherty and Anthony Cumia appeared to be interested in many of the same topics surrounding race and politics at the time. As a journalist, however, Flaherty was not heavily involved in the comedy scene, so I don't really understand why Anthony chose to have him and Ron Bennington on the same episode. While Ron Bennington has never been very politically outspoken, and generally is known for being laid back, he would fight back as Flaherty repeatedly tried to steer the conversation back to the topic of black people, which Ron was uninterested in discussing. This would lead to a confrontation between Ron and Flaherty, which ultimately led to Flaherty storming off the show, and afterwards Ron would remark on how Anthony's show and focus had taken a turn for the worse in another moment of pure honesty and clarity. Like on that Geo or something like that. Geo. That is her movie. So the, so the alternate question is how many movies, how many black movies, mainstream black movies yeah, you get right that black thing in the right last right three wrong. years? I mean, yeah, you're right there. Yeah. So you say so this is like this is like case A of yeah. denial, deceit and delusion. I'm That's sitting right next to you. That's you. Well, you don't know what you're talking about, but that doesn't stop you from talking. So I'm not one of those guys that sits there and listens to bullshit. Well, first of all, don't fucking come in here like we're on the same fucking level with this. I was asked to be on his fucking show. I wouldn't be talking about race if it was up to me. Because you don't know anything what you're talking the about. Fuck why are you talking? If you don't, if you don't know what you're talking about, if you, if you don't know what you're talking about, why say it? I fucking made a joke because that's why Anthony fucking had me. Guess but I forgot not, to laugh. What's that? Guess I forgot to laugh. I don't give a fuck, dude. I'm not fucking here to fucking be angry all the time. 
I'm, I'm telling Ant to go back to the way he used to be. But where was that, Anthony? He was one of the funniest fucking people in the country. I'm still hilarious. Oh my God, what a week. What a fucking week this has been. Uh, let, me, let me look in my um, radio guy handbook. How do, how do you handle this situation? Well, what, what is the fucking problem? That I made a joke? Yeah, I don't know what the problem is. We, we, Ronnie does what Ronnie does. And uh, Colin does what Colin does. And, uh, you know, oil and uh, water, One, they're there because of white racism. Right. Or two, they're there because they got commit, caught committing some very nasty crimes. It's hard to go to jail, you know that. No, not really. People oh, yeah. go to jail all the time. Very hard to go. Uh, what you're saying is we need to put all the black people in jail. No, just the ones who, just the ones who commit crime. And I think everybody's on the same side there. Anybody who commits a crime goes to jail. So I think I, instead, I don't want you to... No, I, I honestly... You come all the way up here from Delaware? No, I'm, 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 I was up here anyway. Yeah. Honestly, I, I just feel I'm making a command decision here that we will have uh, uh, Colin back at a later is... juncture. Thank you, Colin. I could come back at a later No, no, Ronnie, Ronnie, please. Come on now. We, uh, yeah, we... we... Jim Norton stole $60,000. Jim Norton Stole $60,000 refers to a crowd-funded animated series that O&A &A host and comedian Jim Norton created in 2016. The show, titled The Chip Chipperson Show, which drew inspiration from a persona frequently portrayed by Norton on O&A, &A, successfully generated over $60,000 through a fan-supported crowdfunding initiative. However, many fans would turn on the project after it ended early with many believing the quantity and quality of the animated shorts did not reflect the $60,000 budget that the show entirely raised. Many fans believe Jimmy simply walked away with the money early in the project's life without producing any more Chip Chipperson animations, essentially stealing these funds from his fans. <clears throat> I was fucking in scared straight. What? You weren't in Tell scared straight. I was like fucking... Well, 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 for they ain't a bunch of fucking juvies. Oh, you were Three Sharpies. Three Sharpies refers to a disastrous book signing that Anthony Cumia held at a New York City Barnes and Nobel in 2018 for his first book, Permanently Suspended. The Three Sharpies meme originates from the fact that Anthony, anticipating a large crowd of fans, brought several permanent markers with him to sign autographs at the book signing. To his dismay, however, none of his fans would actually show up, and it appears Anthony only signed O and A's very own Bobo, as well as another frequent O and A and Ron and Fez guest known as Big A. According to posts made on Reddit, the book signing was such a failure that it supposedly ended after only 30 minutes because nobody showed up, and because the Barnes and Nobel staff wanted Anthony to leave as soon as possible after someone made them aware of his racist background. It seems that the book signing drew more detractors than it did fans, as a small crowd of people stood in front of the bookstore during the signing and protested Anthony because of his racist behavior. Brother Joe would make an appearance, standing out front the Barnes and Noble and arguing with the protesters like adult for a few minutes before giving up and leaving. Hi, that's why I was like a debater while Brother yeah. Joe. <laughs> no, you see, the you thing is, we don't, we don't come to places that people are employed. We don't come to where people earn their living and make it impossible for them to do so, including every race. There's not a single person of color, an Asian, uh, uh, Hispanic, it doesn't matter. There's no one that Anthony has ever prevented from making a living, making their living. Oh okay. God. What he, he does. But he signed, but he signed, but hold on. Why is the problem? So you're going to tell me. So explain to me. Therefore, he's not really I mean, I honestly like to know both. Cumia Family Freebase Parties. Cumia Family Freebase Parties refers to a rumor about Anthony Cumia and his family that has long been circulated by O and A fans online. At various moments throughout the show's history, Anthony would reveal details about his personal life, including tales of previous drug use. Two particular stories Anthony told on O and A have fueled the Cumia family freebase party rumors. The first was when he mentioned on the show one time how back in the 1980s 
he and his brother used to party with their parents, and that they even used cocaine together as a family on a few occasions. The second story is one Anthony previously told about how he had once smoked freebase cocaine. He would clarify, however, that freebase is different than crack cocaine, and that he had never smoked crack. Anthony may argue that freebase and crack cocaine are distinct, but in my view, the difference is not significant. Both are smokable derivatives of cocaine and represent a more potent and severe form of the drug than the snorted powder version. Crack is whack. Over time, O and A listeners have twisted these two admissions into a theory that Anthony and his parents may have possibly smoked freebase cocaine together at some point. Many find this believable when they consider the natural progression from snorting coke to snorting coke with your parents to then smoking crack. I think anybody that can recognize basic patterns sees what would come next in that depraved sequence. Son, did you guys ever? Do you guys never did crack, right? I never no. did crack. No Jesus, crack. I never did it. I mean, it's. I wonder what it. I smoked a little freebase, <laughs> but not crack. You smoked freebase? Yeah. Is that the wait, same thing? No, God, please. Crack is for those people. Freebase is for you know. Why? That's that's. It's not that little fucking rock of of thing. It's it's a powder. It's much like, what is like, that okay. highlight? No more posts about that Patrick guy. No more posts about that Patrick guy refers to a post written by one of the moderators of the Opie and Anthon subreddit briefly before it was shut down. As I covered previously in my Patrick Tomlinson series, the Opie and Anthony subreddit began targeting Patrick with raids and trolling efforts after he wrote a tweet in 2018 saying, Norm MacDonald wasn't funny. As many of the posts organizing and sharing trolling plans broke Reddit's rules, the sub's moderator team would step in and try to stop the posts, instituting new rules banning Pat posting. It was too little too late, however, as the subreddit was set to private and then banned by Reddit admins a short time later. The quote, No more posts about that Patrick guy, was written by an O and A Reddit moderator by the name of Space Edge. Space Edge was later doxxed and targeted with trolling by O and A subreddit users, who discovered he was allegedly a man by the name of Thomas Apostle, a heroin addict who, at one point, was caught on CCTV stealing a vape from a smoke shop. This discovery was quite memorable among O and A sub-members, and the Thomas Apostle slash Space Edge names would later reappear with a new purpose later in the saga. Joe Cumia Vines Joe Cumia Vines refers to a series of Vine videos uploaded by Brother Joe that have developed a cult status among many Opie and Anthony subreddit users. Fans say these videos, many of which are unintentionally hilarious, showcase Brother Joe's mental retardation and boomer sense of humor. They have been heavily mocked and ridiculed by the Opie and Anthony forums, with some of them even being filmed while Joe was driving on the highway with his child in the car. I know that bears around here somewhere. <laughs> Dance! Animal impressions. <laughs> Lobster Girl. Lobster Girl refers to an early and heavily covered up incident that Opie and Anthony were involved with in 1999. This incident was also likely the beginning of years of conflict and division that eventually would split the duo apart. O and A had decided to do a bit where they threatened to kill a lobster live on air. In response, a woman known as Lobster Girl, who many listeners only describe as crazy, called into the show and later came to the studio where she performed oral sex on Spaz, one of the O&A staff members at the time, in order to save the lobster's life. During this same period, Anthony's wife at the time was very interested in having threesomes and inviting other women into their bedroom, and Lobster Girl caught her attention immediately. The three would hook up, and Lobster Girl would eventually split Anthony and his wife apart, with him divorcing her so he could be with Lobster Girl. After this occurred, the Opie and Anthony show underwent a significant change, with O and A historians noting that Anthony would heavily censor topics on the show during this period and prevent any discussion regarding Lobster Girl and his divorce. I should also note that even though this period of the show was at the height of it being pirated and shared online, for some odd reason the months following the Lobster Girl incident have almost become lost media.
with there being no known sources to find these show recordings online. This incident drove a wedge between Opie and Anthony that only grew larger with time. With Opie being a family man, he likely wasn't pleased with Anthony's behavior, nor did he appreciate how it was affecting the show. Lobster Girl later broke up with Anthony, and it was revealed that she had also slept with several other O and A staff members behind his back. This lesser-known bit of O and A drama damaged the duo's relationship early in the show's history, and partially fueled the conflict that later ultimately split the pair up. Sue Lightning Tit Job Money Sue Lightning Tit Job Money refers to a discovery made by the Opie and Anthony subreddit sometime in 2018. Evidence was revealed by ONA followers online that Anthony Cumia had been spending time with transsexual porn star Sue Lightning and that he was likely paying Sue to have sex with him. In addition to various pictures shared by the two proving they were in the same hotel room, Redditors also claimed to have found public transactions showing how Anthony had transferred money to Sue using Venmo. Many O&A users suggest that Sue Lightning later used this prostitution money to pay for fake boobs in order to further their career as a she-male porn star slash prostitute. Anthony ultimately swept this incident under the rug as he had previously ragged on she-males on his show previously, though eagle-eyed fans would never let him live down his fling with Sue Lightning. Well, last night was a very interesting tweeting night by Anthony Cumia. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Flying Wilson puts, tweet to Anthony, this is more your kind of woman, right? With a picture of Sue Lightning. And then Anthony goes, so what's your point here? Anthony addressing the Sue Lightning thing, saying what's your point? Oh, it gets better, people. Then so, then he puts another tweet at Anthony, this uh, fly, fr uh, Frying Wilson guy. I think it started a little bit like this. And it's the infamous picture of Sue Lightning on Anthony's couch with one of his guns. And then Anthony puts, So, because someone was at my house, I fucked them. Because I hung out with someone, I fucked them. Sue was really fun and a good person to hang out with. Why does that have to lead us to fucking? And even if I did, why would you or anyone else care? Comment. Oh, we're breaking him down, people. <laughs> he is eventually going to have to admit. You got caught, dude. You put your hands in the cookie jar. This is kind of a half admission by itself. With the even if that completes level five, the crying Jim Norton level. We're really reaching into the depths now, as we've just hit level 6, the bottom of the iceberg, aka the prancing Nana level. These O and A moments are straight from the bowels of obscurity. Self-Cutting Girl Self-Cutting Girl refers to a disturbing saga involving Anthony Cumia that first started in 2012. The story goes that a 40-year-old man would begin catfishing Anthony Cumia posing online as a 14-year-old girl going by the username Self-Cutting Girl. Over the span of the next several years, Anthony would chat with the catfish regularly and even send Self-Cutting Girl a MacBook Pro as well as cash and other items from her Amazon wish list. Anthony would later try to play the incident off on air and claimed he was not catfished by the individual and had no involvement. However, a large mountain of evidence was later released, showing Anthony's chat logs with the catfish, along with evidence he had sent them a MacBook. Many scrutinized Anthony's behavior as it appeared he was clearly trying to groom someone who he thought was a minor. While this is a bombshell story, for whatever reason it has received very little publicity outside of the Opie and Anthony community, though it will likely never be forgotten by O and A forums users. Anthony died in 2002. Anthony died in 2002 appears on the surface to be a joke entry about a supposed conspiracy surrounding the real Anthony Cumia dying in 2002, similar to the conspiracy hoax about Paul McCartney dying in the 1960s. However, the entry likely holds a bit more grounding in reality than you'd think, as it refers to the 2002 firing of Opie and Anthony following the sex for Sam incident. Being forced off the air for two years while still receiving a paycheck, 
Many fans believe Anthony Cumia began to drink heavily out of boredom during this time, and that the stress of being forced off the air for two years combined with his heavy dripping habits permanently changed his personality and left him dead inside. While O&A would start back up in 2004 and went on until 2014, this two-year hiatus may have been one of the first foreboding signs of the trouble in store for Anthony's future in radio. Thomas Apostle and O and A Forums Thomas Apostle and O and A Forums refers to the Opie and Anthony Forums, a message board that was started after the suspension of the O and A subreddit. As I've covered in my previous videos, in 2018 the O and A subreddit began to shift their focus away from solely O and A related characters and more onto to the lolcow Patrick S. Tomlinson. After the subreddit was banned in 2018 for breaking Reddit's rules, several users ended up migrating to the O and A forums to continue pat posting and discussing the Opie and Anthony show. Thomas Apostle, a troll using the name of the O and A subreddit moderator that I mentioned earlier, is a notorious O and A forums member turned investigative journalist that would craft an elaborate plot to troll Patrick S. Tomlinson and discredit cancel culture blogger Seth Simons after Patrick filed a lawsuit against the O&A forums in 2021. This saga would later become known as Apostlegate and would be one of the more elaborate trolling efforts pulled off by Opie and Anthony fans. In the end, Thomas Apostle's psyop against Patrick Tomlinson resulted in Patrick being forced to pay over $80,000 to the admin of O&A forums as his lawsuit was sabotaged as a result of the trolls feeding Patrick bad info. Princess Alina Princess Alina refers to a Scandinavian she-male cam star that produced adult webcam content on the internet. O&A fans used to theorize that Jim Norton had a relationship with this she-male cam girl and that he was one of Princess Alina's top donators. Jimmy was known for his romantic interest in she-males and occasionally spoke about dating them on O and A. This theory would later be confirmed as true when in 2023 Jim Norton announced he was getting married to Princess Alina, who now goes by the name Nikki. The couple posted pictures together on social media, where many O&A fans immediately recognized Nikki as the cam star Jimmy had been known to follow in the past. Proud Boy's True Origins This entry refers to Gavin McInnes, one of the co-founders of Vice News, who later would also be known as the founder of the controversial right-wing group, the Proud Boys. At the time he conceived of the group and began to talk about it, McInnes hosted a show on Anthony Cumia's compound network. The Proud Boys would later become known for their involvement in several instances of political violence, with the group battling Antifa on several different occasions around the country. Though the Proud Boys are a decently well-known group today, Thanks to media coverage surrounding their supposed involvement in January 6th, few people know of their connection to Anthony Cumia outside of the O and A world and adjacent communities. Patrice Fake Jail Story The Patrice Fake Jail Story was a tale told by Patrice O'Neill on Opie and Anthony's show. Patrice would talk about how, as a youth, he was falsely accused of rape and had to be snuck out of town in the trunk of a car by his mother in order to avoid arrest. Some O and A fans online have speculated that the story was made up or that Patrice had exaggerated some of the details. However, Patrice is not available for comment, and there's likely no way to verify if the story is true or not. In a hallway in an apartment building, Taking grabbing pussy. her, and sticking your dick out. Taking pussy is rape. Taking yeah. pussy is rape. Now, <clears throat> now, you don't like the idea that if you're with a chick, you're out on a date. Uh, no. There can... If, if, if a woman... I'm going to tell you something. All right. This is how, how, how much you're in the hands of the situation. The... the the, the discretion of the woman if she 
a woman. <laughs> wow. Uh, I'm telling you. Memory. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like the corner. Yeah. Oh, my God. So, holy shit. I can't get through this. I, it's, it's hard to talk about. I type see. Of Take your coat off. Relax a little bit. You're heating up. The flop sweat is forming. Now, I head. found this out. All right. If you're fucking a girl, and uh -huh. being that I'm and six four, seven hundred pound black dude, right? Yeah. If you're fucking a girl, and she thinks no, that's rape. Thinks no. Meaning I'm too scared to say no. Oh shit. And later she could say I was too too afraid to say no to this. But but shouldn't you be able to say well? She was uh, enjoying herself. No, it's not. It's, There's nothing. No, you can't throw anything in as a defense. It's nothing. It's it's it's. it's. Opie's huge penis. Opie's huge penis is another entry that, at first glance, appears to be nothing more than a joke. However, believe it or not, rumors have circulated for many years that Opie is well endowed, with some claiming that he was even packing a hammer. This is another obscure rumor about O and A that only the most dedicated of listeners have heard tale of. This entry could also be alluding to the fact that although Opie was initially seen as the bad guy by O and A fans following the firing of Anthony, many turned around on him after the disturbing allegations against Anthony began to surface online. Today, Opie is seen by many as the good guy who steered the ship and kept the show together while Anthony and Jimmy ran wild. Wow, I can't believe we've made it this far into the iceberg. Congrats, you've just passed level six, and you're ready to explore the deepest, darkest, and murkiest moments from Opie and Anthony down on level seven, the abysmal depths, also known as the Anthony abusing Bobo level. These are some of the most obscure and least known incidents from the show. Without further ado, let's dive into the final level. How Anthony lost his virginity. How Anthony Lost His Virginity refers to a story told by Anthony about his experience losing his virginity. The story goes that Anthony supposedly first got laid at the age of 13 with a 19-year-old girl that his father paid to have sex with him. The story is not very well known, though it has been discussed on Reddit previously, and it makes sense why Anthony didn't talk about it more often. Killacoon Killacoon refers to Christopher Coon an Opie and Anthony subreddit user that will be remembered in infamy. In 2017, Kuhn entered a New Jersey Walmart and stole a $200 Vizio soundbar from the electronics section. A short time after getting in his car with the stolen Is merchandise and leaving the store, the police began to pursue him. Also in the car with Kuhn was his two-year-old son, Quaidon. Kuhn began driving recklessly and crashed his Jeep as he tried to escape the police. Tragically, Quaidon did not survive the accident. Reports indicate that the two-year-old was ejected from the jeep as he was not secured in a car seat and died a short time later from his injuries. Police reported that as Kuhn ran away after the crash, he paused to look at his injured son on the roadway before continuing to flee. Kuhn was arrested and later convicted of murder. Kuhn was relatively well known on the OP and Anthony subreddit prior to this incident, and seemed to have plenty of posts tying his Reddit account to his real-life identity, which is how online sleuths were able to discover what had occurred. What happened to Bobo's sister at the compound? This entry refers to a supposed series of incidents that occurred between Anthony Cumia and the underaged sister of Bobo, a.k.a. Daniel Curlin, who was a frequent guest on O and A. Apparently, at one point, Bobo and his young sister were invited to come party out at the compound, which, if you haven't realized by now, was Anthony's nickname for his basement. According to some O and A fans online, Anthony used his time around Bobo's underaged sister to allegedly groom her, and at one point supposedly even fingered her. Rumors circulating on O and A forums claim that Anthony paid off Bobo's family after this incident in order to keep them quiet. I should probably note that Bobo also experienced a traumatic event at the compound after he drank too much and threw up in Anthony's basement. Anthony would spray cleaning chemicals on him, beat him, 
and force him to clean up his mess, all while the compound's cameras rolled and streamed the incident to viewers online. Because Bobo is mentally disabled, many fans believe Anthony went too far. Bobo's puking in the live studio. Hope you get a. Come on! Stop! Oh, where's the mile? Yeah, Fucking hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment and he's puking on the floor. God damn it. Hey, there's some fucking paper towels. Anthony, I'm fucking. Why did I even fucking invite you here? Wow. You stupid bitch! You dumb. Clean it up! Clean it up! You stupid oh, fuck! That's why I don't have you here! Everything. What are you at before this? Yeah. Well, you're, you're doing a good job holding this shit together, by the way. Yeah, I know. I'm just... I, I don't need to shoot shooting him. Yeah, this is Don in Wyoming. Hey, ask Bobo. I don't think he has the... You puke all on my shit! Right there in the street. Okay, Fred from Brooklyn, I'm giving you a, a shout-out. They're saying you're very helpful. You puked on my laptop, you asshole! Bobo, someone... Patrice Murdered by the Illuminati Patrice Murdered by the Illuminati is a joke entry referring to a supposed conspiracy theory that comedian Patrice O'Neill did not die due to a stroke in 2011, but instead was murdered by the Illuminati for going against their master plan. Opie Killed Chester Opie Killed Chester refers to an incident involving Opie and a dog he supposedly owned at one point named Chester. The story goes that after Chester got up on the counter one night and ate a prime rib that was meant for Opie, he kicked the dog in the liver hard enough that it later died from its injuries. Mike. Hey, uh, oh. Yeah. Hi, boys. Uh, listen, I actually read in the paper they're getting rid of the dog. Oh, yeah? And Yeah, the way they're doing it is they're actually sending him to Opie's house so Opie can kick him in the liver. Oh. <laughs> oh. Ouch! I really don't know what he's talking about. Chester! I have no idea what you're talking about. Chester! Like I said, I have no idea what you're talking Chester, about. Chester, where up. are you, Chester? Shut up! Chester! <laughs> Shut up! Chester, where are you? <laughs> Shut up! Chester, why are you limping like that? Why is Chester boy limping? <laughs> this, is, this never happens. As if someone kicked him in the liver. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> We agreed. We're not ready to tell that one yet. <laughs> We're not, not ready. ready. To... It's been 10 Shut years. Up. It's been 10 years. When will we be ready? We're just not ready for that story. Chester! <laughs> We're not ready for the Chester, Chester story. boy! <laughs> if I didn't Listen. know any better, Chester, I would swear somebody kicked you in the liver. You know what? I'm going to save myself here. Chester has... This will be the cliffhanger. Chester <laughs> This has will be the, the cliffhanger. Silver. Shut up. Chester has liver cancer. <laughs> the vet is saying he, it was caused by... Jagermeister Wolfpack Show 2004, a.k.a. The Show We Can't Talk About. The Jagermeister Wolfpack Show of 2004, a.k.a. The Show We Can't Talk About, is a controversial episode of Opie and Anthony that has been surrounded by rumors since it occurred. The rumor is that in 2004, Sirius XM employee Troy Kwan brought his band known as Wolfpack to the studios, along with a pair of underage girls that were drunk. Allegedly, Troy Kwan used these girls to get his band on the show and had previously done something similar in 1999 in order to get on Howard Stern as well. According to O&A Internet historians, Troy Kwan used to have a band website where he bragged about drugging and sexually assaulting underage girls and claimed that he enjoyed getting minors drunk and hooked on drugs so he could sexually abuse them. During the show, O&A and Troy Kwan supposedly gave the underage girls shots of Jagermeister and got them so drunk that one of them completely blacked out. According to rumors online, Jimmy Norton dragged this passed-out minor into the closet of an empty office room next to O and A's studio. This empty office would later become Ron and Fez's studio. In the closet, Norton allegedly sexually assaulted the minor while she was unconscious. A short time later, both girls were dragged out of Sirius Studios onto the sidewalk, 
where they woke up and began crying and vomiting up all the alcohol they had been fed. Onlookers could clearly tell something was very wrong, and the police were called immediately. NYPD showed up and began investigating the chaotic scene before comedian Ralphie May supposedly stepped in and convinced the police to back off and leave them alone. Since Ralphie was one of the only people there that wasn't drunk, it's believed that the police listened to him and left without questioning what had gone on that day at O and A's studio. This incident is an obscure and mysterious rumor whispered among O and A fan circles online, and to this day, nobody from O and A has come forward or addressed what happened during the show, and the topic seems to have been completely banned from O and A. Allegedly, however, Jim Norton was supposedly known to brag about this incident on the air ceremoniously every year on November 24th. As to if these claims are true or not, it's not exactly clear, though many online insist they absolutely are true. That concludes the Opie and Anthony Iceberg. For those of you who made it to the end, congratulations on everything you may have learned about Opie and Anthony along the way. Make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed today's video, and be on the lookout for more content like this in the future. And if you're interested in diving even deeper into the insanity of the Opie and Anthony fandom, you should check out my playlist of all my videos on the Patrick S. Tomlinson saga and his battle with the O and A subreddit and forums. This has been Cryptic Web Chronicles. Thanks for watching. Good night.